Um, our next speaker is, uh, oh, I should just wait for the recording. Did you already restart? Are you okay? Yeah. Um, our next uh, speaker is Christian Kohler um, from Bonn, Germany, who's going to speaking, speak about managing audio monitoring data with a software called Simon. Yes, hello. Let me just start my presentation. Um, here we go. Um, you might be wondering why I make you listen to a talk about uh, audio data, which is not a core topic of uh, the TED week. But actually, um, this is only the, um, the uh, wide idea which I had, um, and we'll have to talk about standards within this project. And I thought, who knows better about um, standards and um, data schemas than Tedwig. Uh, but first of all, I have to tell you some about my idea uh, to put it into some context. Um, there was a new format at Tedwig 2017, I think, um, which was called Wild Ideas, where you um, just talk about something that, that is not really ready, um, not fully designed. And uh, when I was asked to come up with a new system for managing audio data for a project that was supposed to start last year, uh, it never happened due to various reasons. But still, um, I had to think about um, what do I do with the data? And wouldn't it be a good idea to think the the whole story before starting. So um, what you have a lot of times is uh, you, have, you create an application with a nice interface, nice data schema, and then you want to um, send it out to the world, send it to the aggregators. Um, and then you start to think about, well, how do I do that? And um, I didn't want to be, uh, get stuck in this situation again. Having worked at uh, various uh, projects, uh, managing data, um, sometimes uh, people come up to me and ask, um, well, uh, I've, I've some really nice data. Can you upload it for me? And uh, being a nice guy, I say, yeah, sure. Uh, just give me your data. I will upload it to whatever you want. And usually I would expect something like this nice structured data, um, nice um, and correct uh, metadata, but usually this happens. And I'm, I'm not uh, exaggerating, I, I've seen it all. I, I've seen um, a plastic bag full of MD tapes uh, mixed with uh, floppy disks. And uh, I was told this is my research work of 25 years. Um, just uh, upload it and uh, I don't, care how you do it. Well, you can imagine it's um, this is nothing you want to get stuck with. So I was thinking about how could I do it better? Because the, the supposed uh, project uh, wanted to produce some terabytes of uh, monitoring data from hundreds of recording places uh, over the time per year. And I didn't want to end up with a box of uh, SD cards um, at the end of the project. Um, so I tried how, how could I make it easy for the, the researchers and for, for me at the same time. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, this a bit. This is not really a Tedwick um, uh, topic. Uh, it it's get, gets interesting at here at the API to disseminate the data, but to give you the whole picture, here's the rough concept of, of Simon. Um, we were looking for some audio recorders that were cheap, um, that were programmable, that uh, you could toss in the field and wouldn't have to worry about, uh, and we stumbled across the um, the audio moth, I've 
in case you're looking at, the, at my video of one right here. So you see it's, it's a really small device. Um, maybe somebody could put in the, um, the link in the, in the show notes. Uh, it costs about 50 uh, euro or 50 uh, US dollars. You can run it uh, a couple of weeks uh, out in the field, uh, record an SD card. Uh, it ranges well into ultrasound um, and uh, you can um, program it to, to run scheduled, let's say once every hour for five minutes or every morning uh, at doom or whatever. Um, but it has no uh, Wi-Fi, has no uh, means of communicating to the world. Um, to make it easier for the um, researchers in the field, uh, I was playing with a um, Raspberry Pi with a um, touch screen. So you can go in the field and just extract the data and all the metadata. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details too much. Um, build a little prototype. This is what, what it would look like. And uh, then the, um, the data collector would automatic uh, lo upload it to an um, online repository, cloud-based um, system with long-term storage, the usual user and group management, um, included some, um, yeah, something to play around with the uh, sound files and, and uh, explore them playback, uh, filter for signals, analyze, uh, make, make annotations uh, or comments or um, share the data. Just send out a link to a data set or data or download whole data sets or that this is where it uh, gets interesting. Um, disseminate them to, to data portals and Having this idea, um, the first question came up to me, what do I have to consider to make this happen? Um, I could invent my, my own data schema and store my, my, all my data metadata in a relational database. And then after that, think about how do I get it to GBIF, to whatever. But, um, I know th those problems. I know um, it's hard to convert data. Um, we have the um, had the talks on the alignment group with ABCD and Darwin Core, Darwin Core Archive. And if you don't consider the, the right data schema from the right beginning, you will always have the, the problem of um, how do you convert. And conversion always means or a lot of time means that you lose information. So I'm here today to um, get some opinions. What uh, what would you uh, your preferred data schemas be? Where would you like to um, see your data um, published? And um, have not started with a project yet. It's still a wild idea, as I said. Um, I'm, I'm key to hear what, uh, what Tedwig thinks or what uh, people at Tedwig think, uh, what they would like to see, um, what, what standards, what portals, what data aggregators are the ones to um, be targeted first or um, do we have to have multiple strategies to um, disseminate data, to store data? And well, yeah. That's about it. Um, I wanted to keep it short to have some time for discussion because I'm really eager to hear what the experts think. Thank you. That's great. I think we have a few experts here. Um, I, it did occur to me that, and I'm just jumping in and asking my own question first, I'm afraid, that if you use the iNaturalist API, you can actually just upload sound to there uh, with all the metadata, and then you can let other experts that do the identifications for you and, and things like that. Um, and you just have to deal with the collecting of the sound in the first place. Um, yeah. This uh, this is one uh, idea I, I have myself. 
Um, it's sometimes a bit hard if you work with research institutions because they want to keep their data close. They want to have uh, a server where they can look at and say, here's my data, uh, it's all mine, and if uh, I can do whatever I want. Um, to be honest, that's the beauty of iNaturalist because you can actually keep the license closed on it. It's out there, but you, you don't necessarily need to have an open license on it in my iNaturalist. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm totally open for that. Um, it's, it's, uh, I've, I have to convince, uh, convince the, the people who produce the data uh, to, to follow this, this road. Um, okay, so I better actually do other people's questions. So David Fischmuller asks, why have a touch screen on a device in the field and not make it just controllable by a smartphone? Uh, why um, good question. Um, we, we are thinking about that um, because um, for, for this one specific project, we needed something uh, that is cheap and uh, deployable in a, in a wide range of, of use cases um, and um, Raspberry Pi for let's say 50, 60 Euro or do, uh, US dollars is uh, much easier to distribute and to, to maintain. But um, a smartphone app is uh, another possibility. Uh, on the other hand, the, the Raspberry Pi, I can attach um, like a four terabyte uh, SSD storage in the field and run it uh, from battery uh, that might be hard on a smartphone. Uh, no, uh, just to avoid miscommunication. No, I, I meant having the Raspberry Pi out in the field, but just without the touchscreen, controlling the Raspberry Pi, combining advantages of both. But yeah, okay, you, you'll think oh, possible. about it. Possible, yeah, it's, it's possible. Okay. Um, so Steve Baskov has a comment, but I think it's an important one, that the Audubon core, uh, I guess, interest group is developing guidelines for sound right at the, at the moment. And there's a report by Dan Stowell um, already pre produced. Um, so um, I guess he's recommending you go away and have a look at that um, in terms of standards. Uh, there's a link in there too to the GitHub repository for that. Uh, Dimitri Shigel asks, publishing audio derived occurrence and sampling event data, I assume it means, uh, through GBS is very welcome. And there is a way to associate audio with records. I would be interested in good capture of processing steps and standardization of those, including sonograms. So yeah, I think That'd be quite interesting to see because there is a very, very big community of uh, bioacoustic people. Um, and I don't see them that much. Maybe I'm not looking, uh, but on GBIF, whale people, bat people, insect people, bird people. Um. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to, to um, get this bridge because on the other hand, I'm, I'm talking to the uh, bioacoustic people uh, and, and make them uh, aware of, of uh, the data portals, the aggregators, and uh, the advantages uh, they would have to, to publish the data on a, one of the big aggregators. Um, and a lot of times it's just, they don't know how. I think Dimitri wants to pop in. Uh, thanks, yes. I, that sounds actually very similar to what I presented on the sequence derived data. This is an isolated community, never seen at Tadwig and uh, they like, but very often, if explained well, the benefits of resurfacing their data, in addition to their own portal, their own playgrounds, when they meet each other and they mix their sounds and so on, this resurfacing through general biodiversity discovery platform is very beneficial for them. They, they have different uptake, different use and reuse in the context they cannot even imagine. So um, I see this as like, we actually on a very similar mission, and I would be very interested to, 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 in talking about that in more details. There are communities who actually not only record uh, species, but quantify the chorus of whatever is singing, insects, birds, amphibians together, and dividing them into sonograms. You probably know the kitchen much better than I do, yeah. but uh, turning that into the kind of uh, quantitative community signals and exposing this as ecology ready, Data sets would be great. Thank you yep. very much. Excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I think 
Okay, I think Steve Basco puts in another comment to see also Ed Baker's and Dan Stowell's presentation of the earlier Tadwig workshop. That's the one that was two weeks ago, um, where there was, um, I guess there was an Audubon core workshop in that. Um, and someone could perhaps share the link of the Tadwig YouTube um, so that people can find that. Um, so yes, yeah, Steve Basco from water participation in discussions. So he would be very happy to, if you could act as a bit of a bridge to the, uh, the bioacoustics people for that too, I'm sure. Um, Marika Peterson. Mike, Marika, do you want to just say your question out loud? Yeah, sorry, I can't. <laughs> um, no, it's not a question. It's just uh, the comment <clears throat> that we, it's also already a couple of years ago, that we published um, sound data on Europeana, so just to reach out outside of our community, and that they can somehow um, be re reused and uh, for other use cases. And we are also now um, in closer connection with the German Digital Library. So if you're interested in this, um, just contact me. Yeah, um, I've, I've got feedback that uh, from, from researchers publishing on Europeana um, that their data was, after some years, was not available anymore for reasons they could never really explore. Um, and uh, this this is uh, like f for me it's it's one one of the the uh, big aggregators I'm targeting at but um, from the feedback I got people were not always too happy with that. So they weren't they weren't happy because they weren't didn't want to share that. No, because they they, they shared the data they, they had it uploaded uh, there and. Um, when they looked back after two or three years, they couldn't find their data anymore. And they, um, I'm not sure if uh, what the reasons are, but uh, that's just the, the, the feedback I got. And- uh, Usually it's so like Europeana just links to our databases. So that's maybe not the fault of Europeana, but maybe- No, I'm, I'm not fault. saying that, but maybe the just the workflow was uh, too complicated or um, the, the original data source was, for some reason not available. Uh, and for the uh, German, um, are you talking about the um, Tierstim Archiv Berlin? No, well, that's another aggregator. I'm talking about the German digital library. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one, one place to uh, uh, one place to uh, just yeah. if you're interested in it so I'm more or less coordinating all those things so just um, contact me maybe I can help out yeah thank you I can see other comments being put into the uh, into the table I don't see any specific questions unless anyone wants to put their hand up um So we have time actually for some more general discussions. And um, I was trying looking through the talks and trying to, uh, these are contributed orals, uh, but then somebody uh, in the program committee decided how to group these. And I was trying to figure out how, what the theme was. Um, and one, if, if there was a theme going through these contributed orals, it was uh, a lot of people working um, starting new projects, um, uh, new techniques and new methods, and struggling a bit with the ability to squeeze those into our pre-existing standards and understanding um, how, how to fit them in, maybe building their own standards or their own data structures. Um, and I wondered if anyone out there had some advice on how how best to do that because nothing ever seems to fit the first time. Um, does anyone have any comment on that? Dimitri? 
I can maybe share a little bit of experiences in that area. Um, all all the, all these communities uh, slightly new to all, to the Tadwick circles. Um, they they need to be convinced that this is a good idea. So there is a, a particular communication effort. I think many of us are familiar with that. That uh, you you come to molecular ecology conference and these people have probably never heard even of Tadwick and they they play their own game and suddenly you come with a talk saying like, look, if it's discoverable through a different platform, your life will be better. And this is how you get citations, you get new uptake and so on and so on. There'll be always some skeptics who say like, like uh, you said, Christian, like over my dead body, this is like, it is my data. And they literally mean it, like th that you, you, can, you can see this data in the common use after, after people actually pass away. And, uh, but some, some are hesitating. Others say like, wow, great. Why didn't you teach me uh, this immediately? And so, we we have to handle this gradient of attitudes at all times and and but i think if we start working with eager ones and those hesitating ones providing them clear benefits why this is cool and giving them clear instructions uh then then the 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 volume of such data from not so trivial data sources uh, will be growing and in that space uh, when you reach that yes okay you'll find people who say that teach me i will do it myself then there'll be a huge volume of people who said like, look, this is all sounds very cool, but I won't move my finger to have it published. Like you can have my Excel tables, they're a little bit messy, you know, but if you do that for me and put my name on it, I'm happy. So that is a kind of uh, um, an issue still, like uh, there'll be a bottleneck uh, of, of, of desire to have the data published. But then even if they say yes, there'll be another bottleneck of actual ability and wish to, to put any effort into that. I don't have good answers to this. I just wanted to throw it in the air. So. And if any, does anyone have a good answer to that? I can only add that for us, it's just the same. It happens the same thing. So repeated situation here. I think what has, what has helped uh, to some extent is now that journals are a lot more rigorous about uh, getting people to put their data into their publications. You still see that done as minimalistically as people can get away with. Um, but if you guys are out there reviewing papers and you see that their supplementary data are a mess and not conforming to standards, then you know we're all in empowered to uh, suggest modifications to that paper before it's published so that um, the data are actually put somewhere sensible and in a repository and contain all the right metadata so that you can repeat the experiments, and things like that. Quentin, I was thinking about this a lot, and I think that, like the there was a common proposal that let's fix instructions to authors, add a little paragraph on the data availability, and everything will be wonderful. Uh, but even if it's done, I mean, the actual gatekeepers of of open data progress they are reviewers and editors. That paragraph should not only come to the instruction to authors, but very importantly to the instructions to the reviewers and the editors. So when you review a manuscript and you tick all these boss, uh, boxes, is the title adequate, if it's novel, and so on and so on, there must be a line or two saying like, did you see the data, is it okay? And if it's not, then we, then, uh, we will probably reach a gene bank-like situation that no data, no review. I mean, I'm not saying that the sticks is the only solution, but uh, you, 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 you said very correctly that most submitting authors in a great hurry will do absolutely minimum. And if it's not required, we will not see it happening on the wide scale. Maybe just for fun, people can put the exclamation mark in the chat if they've actually review, reviewed the supplementary data of a paper uh, for what standards it's using. Let's see how many we get. Oh, very good. <laughs> So people are doing it. James, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just thought I'd say that, you know, I've always been a big proponent about repeatable science. And of course, the standards are essential to how repeatable something is. It's one thing to just throw a bunch of data up there, but it's another thing to make sense of it. 
uh, in any way. And, you know, from the publisher's perspective, I think we're, I mean, I think, you know, it's not us, but, but the greater us uh, is, is we're making, we're making an impression on them that, that repeatable science based on having the data be public is important. Um, but of course, I, I think we're still trapped in that. How easy is it to do something? You know, and that's where it comes to the science, the researchers who are busy, they don't want to take hours and hours associating independent records with things, you know, it's, it's painful. Uh, and so, you know, Pensoft gets that and, and they've made that a little friendlier, but lots of course haven't. Uh, and so, you know, I think our relevance is only increasing in the sense of the interoperability, the ability to evaluate repeatable science. Uh, and so I think we have to keep our, you know, finger on that. Uh, but you know, I still feel like we're really slowly climbing that hill and I don't know what makes that faster because it makes so much sense. It's so, in this day and age of fake news and so, you know, it makes so much sense, but we just can't, we can't seem to nudge that thing to go any faster. I don't know why. Yeah, Christopher, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm representing GigaScience. We have a database that also goes behind all of the manuscripts. So we um, actually focus on reproducibility and, and all of the things associated with that and fair data and like. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time looking at manuscripts, not just biodiversity, but across the board of life sciences to try and make sure that they are reproducible. One thing that we like is communities that have come together and put together checklists to enable us to do that without having the relevant experience in the particular field. So. I don't know much about imaging, but I can go along to, to an imaging data set and, and look at it and know what to expect if there's a, a relevant checklist there. So is that something Tadwood community has thought about putting together some sort of um, checklist of how to, how a reviewer should look at a manuscript when they're reviewing it for biodiversity data? I don't think we've done it enough, but it sounds like, a, I think we've done it a little bit. Uh, it sounds, sounds like something we should definitely be doing. Um, I know under the COVID task group, we've recently been looking at how the best practice for publishing uh, virus data derived from specimens. And basically that is what you're saying is here's the data that you need to have done and the best practice for doing that and, and vouchering. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be very interested to, if you've got examples to share them in the document so we can have a look at them and, and we can think about how we can perhaps take that forward. Okay. Just to add to this, a couple of years ago in Leipzig, when Geobon organized a meeting uh, trying to solve or increase the availability of data from ecology, there were the editors in chief of very heavyweight ecology journals ready to publish a joint editorial statement, uh, which is which is a big thing. People do pay attention to this. Uh, but what was missing, and I think st is still missing, uh, is that um, a kind of um, a community agreement of the what what should be in place for you as a reviewer or the editor to say yeah okay go to review uh, we we do, we don't have this checklist and I think it would be a wonderful idea to build one from Tudwick or develop the existing ones if they are existing somewhere or oh, there is one from Rio I can see Timus posted James go ahead another thing I was going to say and just the sense of making things easier is uh, having our software, uh, content management systems, you know, of, of various kinds, um, be able to produce data in formats through sort of workflows, templates that allow research data to be pushed out in, in a very easy way, depending on where things are being published. So our sequence, just as an example, our sequence database, um, we use that across many projects and we have templated the ability to go to short read, to go to bold, to go to all those things. So, you know, our researchers literally just have to tick the boxes. These are all the things I want, collect them into a batch, into a set, and then they just push a button and say, make this, you know, make this go to bold. All the metadata, we understand what all those are. And if it doesn't validate, we have a validator running over to say, ooh, you can't do that yet because you're missing these fields. Uh, we make it as simple as possible. And I know they have really appreciated this. So some of that can be on us just to make our applications be friendly in order to make it easy for them to share the data the way we want them to. Yeah. I think making it easy for people is definitely a good way to go because it, no one should ever think that the data management is easy or quick. Uh, it's, 
it requires skilled people and it takes time to do nicely. I was wonder if any of the other speakers want to say anything, uh, uh, anything particular in the grand discussion we're having now, um, uh, the general discussion. Um, I know a, a couple of times, uh, so Damiano, you have the issue of you're using aggregated data and so you actually have a problem of maintaining the provenance of data once it's all aggregated together. Um, and I know you can just about trace the source of every single data, but it's not easy to get credit for all the people who make up an occurrence cube effectively. Yes, well, we can uh, indeed, um, thanks to GBIF, we can credit uh, all the data sets that are used to make the occurrence cube. That's already something. Uh, but indeed, using provenance, we can uh, make things more detailed and to say these data are used for these pieces, for example. Yes. So we can go farther and farther, making the things more discoverable and uh, indeed uh, giving more credit with things that are published. Yes. But indeed, it's not, uh, it's not easy. And another point that I always uh, I have problems uh, as a my background as physicist physicist is that uh, measurements have an uncertainty and please think about that um, and I always concerned I always say that uh, Quentin knows that I'm quite <laughs> you're bored probably about this uh, but uh, I'm really concerned and uh, we need to think about this because otherwise we we produce a lot of biased data. Um, and I don't know, I'm not a specialist in DNA, but uh, I suppose there is an uncertainty also in assigning species from DNA sequences, probably. And uh, I'm quite curious how is going on about that, because up to now in my institution and, uh, and so on, I never heard about uh, speaking about uncertainty assigned to this kind of measurement. So maybe it's an open question to the specialist. Well, Dimitri, that's definitely for you. Uh, so uh, uncertainty can be measured uh, around sequence data actually a little bit easier than about, let's say, result of the museum digitization. All, all identifications, for instance, they are probabilistic. Human or machine made, there is certain probability of the match to your target name being correct. If you have sequence data, you can actually calculate this probability and you can sort and rank your data by how happy you are about the result. It is much harder to do that about human identifications when they used a microscope 200 years ago and who knows which identification keys. And so you basically rank human reputations, which is very, very sensitive thing to do. Uh, uh, so um, I'm not sure um, if, if this is um, coming to kind of common practices, but I think I think uh, calculating uncertainties, they, they are uh, common in the georeferencing context, right? And uh, something like that uh, should happen to, to all uh, measurements and interpretations, ideally, because this is, this, is, this is how you can deal with the context specific quality issues. But oftentimes you're just lucky to have any data to start with, so. Uh, James, you can help me out, probably. Well, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree with Daniano that, you know, we have to be conscious of this. And, and it's, it's hard because, you know, in the sense of standards and things, we don't want, if, if we put uncertainty fields on everything, um, it makes things, it makes our standards bigger, it makes them heavier, it makes more, you know, again, that researcher is going to say, oh, man, if I have to fill out this profile, uh, it's going to take me a day. Um, but on the other side, we have to be open. And, and I think we suffer a bit for this because of the way the science is done. So the, the sequence itself is easy enough and we have error checking what that comes out of a sequencer. But the trouble is as soon as we walk down the analysis path, we are black boxing and black boxing and black boxing our way and sort of gradually moving away in some ways from the truth uh, in order to find another truth. 
And I think we have to be honest in our, you know, this is where publishing the workflows is critical to say, well, I use this software on that was this version at this time and it gave me this and if you repeat this six months from now it won't give you the same answer i can guarantee it if you don't use exactly this workflow and even if you do the uncertainties through all of those different things that you pop through will make it almost sure that you cannot get the same answer again we've, we've done tests of these things and then the the next part which has always been complicated is tying organisms to these analyses, uh, you know, in, in the DNA world. And uh, we struggle a bit there, but the, again, openness, what are the algorithms we're using? And can I see it? You know, can I look at it? Someone like Damiano is going to get more out of that and have a different opinion about that algorithm than I might with my expertise. So it's not just about the data's accuracy. It's about what are those algorithms doing to give us an answer? And I think that's really important too. I'm going to have to draw it to a close there, but thank you very much. Um, so I'd really like to thank very sincerely to all of the people who spoke today. Um, it's been really interesting and I, um, you was very patient with my moderating. Thank you very much for that too. Um, I need to just, uh, I was going to show uh, one thing I forgot to do early on. I'll show you this. I can. Um, so, because I didn't uh, thank all the people who have helped us put on the conference, um, I should put on the splash screen. I also wanted to point out to you um, that uh, Tadwig is actually having its elections now. So every uh, year, half of the executive is elected. Um, we spoke about that at the business meeting yesterday, but I'm aware that many of the people from Europe wouldn't have been there because it was quite late at night. Um, the deputy chair, the secretary, uh, two of the functional subcommittee chairs and uh, regional representatives are up for election this year. The deadline for nominations is the uh, 16th of November. Um, I think all the people on the Tabby exec would uh, agree that it's a very worthwhile thing to do. You're going to learn a lot about what it uh, is uh, to be in biodiversity informatics and uh, you will enjoy it. Um, there'll be some interesting times for sure, like when there's a pandemic or something like that, uh, but it makes uh, life much more richer to get involved and feel like you're really doing something uh, helpful for the community. Um, I'm sure there's probably something else I'm forgetting to say. If, if James and Paula want to jump in and say anything more about that, they're very welcome to. Next, next session, Quinn. Next session. Okay, I'm going to have to just turn that off so that. Uh, in the chat. Uh, it's in the chat, is it already? Input, next thanks. session will be a panel discussion on the open or extended digital specimen concept. Perfect. There you go. So Tim can moderate the next session. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that's everything. Thank you ever so much for everyone who came. Um, and uh, thank you again to the speakers and all to the helpers too, to Paula, to David and to Peter. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well done, Quentin. Thank, thank you, you. Quentin, everyone. Quentin, you will have to start to start the recording. You were up to host when I was kicked out of the room. Sorry, Apollo, I can't hear you quite. Oh. I think oh, we need to stop, stop the recording. recording.